This man broke 15 bones when he fell into a glacier. Here's how he survived. He knew that if he couldn't climb out, the crack in the ice would become his grave. John All unzipped his tent, poking his shaggy blonde head out into the thin alpine air and took in the view. The sun sparkled off the freshly fallen snow on the jagged peaks and crags of Mount Himlung. It was just before 10 a.m. on May 19, 2014, a perfect morning in the Himalaya. All, a 44-year-old scientist, had come to Nepal on research expedition to collect snow samples for a study of pollution. His two climbing partners had retreated down to base camp until one of them could recover from a stomach ailment. They were expected back in a day or two, but for now, All was alone at 20,000 feet. Climbing solo in the Himalayas is never advisable, but All's plan was to remain cautious, stick near camp, and begin collecting samples. But first, he was dying for a cup of coffee. He grabbed his snow axes and walked toward a flat area a short distance away that looked like an ideal spot to gather fresh snow to melt for water. The temperature was between 25 and 30 degrees. After weeks at high elevation, that felt positively balmy. So All was dressed lightly in wind pants, a thin jacket over a t-shirt, and hiking boots with crampons, uh, metal spikes that helped climbers traverse icy terrain. He took a step and then another. Suddenly, the ground gave way beneath him, and he plunged into darkness. All's face smashed into something hard as he plummeted downward. He instinctively reached out with his right hand, trying to grab an axe into the ice to slow his progress. But the weight of his falling body wrenched his arm out of its shoulder socket, leaving behind a mess of shattered bone and torn soft tissue. As he careened against the icy walls with growing speed, his mind seemed to slow down. He realized with horror what had happened. He had stepped into a crevasse, a crack that had opened in the glacier and extended down who knew how deep. How did I make this mistake, he thought. Then he had another thought. There's no way you can survive a crevasse fall. All's right side slammed into something hard. His fall stopped with a crunch of bone. I'm dead, he thought. Then he felt his lungs heaving, straining to suck wind back into his body, each gasp bringing a jolt of excruciating pain. He looked down and saw his legs hanging over the chasm. He had landed on a shelf of ice suspended above the blackness. Overheard was a pale halo of blue-white light, seven stories up, where he had punched through the crust of snow. The entire right side of his body had been crushed. He couldn't move. But for now, he was alive. John All was not supposed to be on Mount Himlung. A month earlier, he'd been at Mount Everest Base Camp, sharing black tea with a young Sherpa, Asman Tamang, a shy father of a nine-month-old was climbing Everest for the first time, and All teased him, saying Tamang would make record speed up the mountain. All had climbed Everest before, but this time he was leading an expedition of scientists to Everest's sister peak, Mount Lutz, to collect evidence of black dust, emissions from factories thousands of miles away. For All, a professor at Western Kentucky University, the mountains were a second home, the rare place where six-foot-five former triathlete could combine his love of physical adventure with his scientific curiosity. On the morning of April 18th, All woke to the ground rumbling. An ice shelf had collapsed, sending a chunk of ice the size of an apartment building tumbling down the side of Everest. Sixteen climbers were killed, as Montemang among them. Everest and Lotz were shut down for them. After a week of mourning his friend, All and his two partners headed to nearby Mount Himlung to continue their work. From his icy seat, 70 feet deep in the earth, John All gasped for breath and tried to gather his thoughts. Climbers fall into crevasses all the time, but those who survive usually fall only a short way, aren't by themselves, and certainly aren't badly injured. All knew of only one person who'd made it through such a long fall and climbed out by himself. The mountaineer Joe Simpson, who'd survived a fall in Peru, All would try to become the second. Taking in his surroundings, All realized he wasn't on a shelf, but a chunk of ice that had fallen through the fissure and became wedged between the walls. In an ever-moving, ever-shifting glacier, how long would it stay wedged? He rocked his body slightly, testing his limitations, and a jolt of pain radiated through him, leaving him dizzy. He had 15 broken bones in total, he would learn later, including six crushed vertebrae. His right arm was entirely useless, and the ribs on his right side were shattered, making every breath ag. His abdomen felt sore and stiff, a sign of internal bleeding, and he had a coppery taste in his mouth an indication of possible kidney or liver damage. He touched his face and found that blood from gouges in his eye socket and forehead had congealed in the cold, stopping the bleeding momentarily. It took all almost 10 minutes just to wrench himself upright and squirm over to a secure perch on his block of ice. The effort left him panting. Icy air blew up from the depths of the glacier. Already, he could feel his body shivering and his fingers freezing, quickly becoming numb. 
By 4 p.m. these shadows cast by the high mountain peaks would leave him in the dark and unable to climb. His research partners weren't scheduled to come back to camp until the next day or possibly even the day after. By then he would have frozen to death. He had roughly six hours to make it to the surface and to his tent or he would die. All as a researcher, someone who makes a record of everything he does. Now out of instinct he reached into his pocket, brought out his camera and pressed record. Thank God I stopped on this ledge, he said to the camera his breath ragged, spatters of blood visible in the snow. How do I get back up there, though? Above him, the snow was soft. The air from the crevice condensed on the walls and left a surface the consistency of whipped cream. Where he had landed, the width of the crevice was about eight feet. But looking to his right, he saw a spot hundreds of feet away where the fissure appeared to narrow. If he was lucky, it just might be narrow enough for him to chimney his way up or climb by bracing his body against both sides of the crevice until he reached the surface, all while using only one arm. First, though, he would need to get there, using his crampons and snow axes, to move across the wall of sheer ice. All kicked the points of his crampons onto the ice until they held. With his left hand, he planted one axe at eye level. Then he reached the same hand across his body to plant the other axe as far to the right as possible. Clutching the first axe, he shuffled his feet to the right, kicked his crampons into the ice, shifted his weight, and then grabbed the second axe, again with his left hand. His body screamed with pain, but he had moved. Now he just had to do this a few thousand more times. Stab with the axe, kick his feet, shift his weight, repeat. All was free climbing inside a crack in the mountain, trying not to dwell on the fact that one misstep could send him tumbling to his death. Instead, he concentrated on getting to another slab of ice that had become lodged in the crevasse about 50 feet up. Over the years, all had found that he functioned well in dangerous situations. He had a tattoo of a black mamba on his calf, a token of the time he'd kicked a six-foot-long poisonous snake in Potswana before it could strike. He tried to make the climb an academic puzzle, a question of geometry. If he could figure it out, he would live. Stab, kick, shift, repeat. At times, the ice gave way beneath all's crampons, sending chunks of the wall tumbling into the chasm. But his axe held him tight. After about half an hour, he'd reached the slab of ice. He rested, gratefully, gulping the meat locker cold air into his lungs. The sound of his own jagged breath as he struggled to get enough oxygen at this altitude mixed with the cracking of the glacier, that living, moving mass of ice that surrounded him. He knew that if he didn't make his way out, his body would likely remain there for years. Perhaps when the glacier had retreated, future generations would discover the corpse in the green windbreaker and wonder who had been foolish enough to go climbing alone. He started moving again, his eyes fixed on the next ice block, about 50 feet to his right. Suddenly a jolt of inexpressible pain struck. He looked down and saw the void beneath, the cavern disappearing into a black infinity. Against his will, the thought flashed through his mind, I'm going to die. He thought of his 67-year-old mother and imagined her sadness on receiving the news. Then he gathered himself again and forced himself on, stabbing the axe back into the wall. Now the edges of the crevasse were narrowing, the surface of the walls, a tangle of icy protrusions and deceptively fragile crystalline formations that all scraped aside with his frozen fingers. Slowly, he began to climb upward, swinging his ice tools into the walls and finding his footing, each step taking excruciating minutes as he tried to gather his energy. The crevasse was tight enough for him to chimney his way up now as he braced his back against the wall. Stab, kick, shift, repeat. Time moved strangely in the crevasse, marked by uneven breaths, but he was making progress. After about four hours in the crevasse, all could see the glow of the sun beneath a thin crust of snow. Finally, he swung an ax upward and broke through. A tiny patch of blue sky appeared. As all cleared the snow, making the hole wider, he had the distinct feeling that he'd just dug himself out of his own grave. He hauled himself up and lay there, halfway in and halfway out, utterly exhausted and unable to move. Five minutes later, with a final burst of energy, he forced his body to flop forward onto solid ground. He staggered to his feet and immediately collapsed again. He couldn't walk. He could barely get to his knees. That's when he realized just how truly broken his body was and how much trouble he was still in. In the Himalayas, death from hypothermia comes quickly. All was a three-minute walk away from his tent, but it might as well have been three miles. You didn't come this far to not make it, he told himself. He pulled his body forward on his stomach. His face plowed through the snow. All shivered in agony as he dragged his broken ribs across the ground. The short walk took two hours of crawling, 
it was late afternoon and the shadows were deepening when he finally lunged into the tent all reached for his handheld satellite community he knew he wouldn't survive until his partners reached he was bleeding internally and needed to be rescued the walkie talkie sized machine could only send messages not make phone calls and at that moment it was connected to the Facebook page of an organization he'd co-founded the American climber science program back home in Kentucky it was 4 a.m. everyone he knew was likely asleep but he prayed someone would see his cry for help with numb fingers he typed out a message please call global rescue John broke an arm ribs internal bleeding fell 70 foot crevasse climbed out him lung camp 2 he posted please hurry from her house on the big island of Hawaii biologist Rebecca Cole was getting ready for bed when she decided to log on to Facebook when she saw John all's message her heart sank Cole and her husband Carl Schmidt had co-founded the American climber science program with all he was the guy they referred to as their charismatic megafauna a big fun presence with a magnetic personality who drew people to the organization when Cole read her friends cry for help she quickly began pinging messages across the globe trying to arrange a helicopter rescue on Mount Himlung all was spending the longest night of his life his throat was parched but with only one working arm he couldn't manage to open his water bottle he sucked down two energy gels tried to cover his body with a sleeping bag and lay in a dazed pain in the dark finally the light outside began to the Sun creeping up the edges of the tent and warming his chilled body on the other side of the world his friends were trying to find a rescue team willing to take a helicopter to such an altitude where the air is thin and aircraft can act erratically after 18 hours on his back his broken body had tensed up leaving him near paralysis all heard the faint whir of a helicopter soon after the tent's door unzipped and a Nepali rescuer poked his head through the flap the rescuer dragged all on a sleeping mat before hauling him into the helicopter as the copter twisted through the Himalayas all finally allowed the relief to flood through I'm alive he whispered as all recovered from his injuries he sometimes felt as if a part of him had never escaped the crevasse he talked freely about Tamang's death and his own escape but he kept himself the teller of the story and not the subject it was all so raw and overwhelming says all I had to keep it in the third person in March 2015 almost a year after his near-death experience all visited Rebecca Cole in Hawaii by now he was physically healed but Cole could see that her friend was still shaken so she says I took a week off to take John on as many hikes and adventures as he was physically able to handle one day they climbed Mauna Loa the largest volcano in the world as they trekked it began to snow a rarity in tropical Hawaii and soon they were breaking trail through three feet of snow on their way to the summit being in the snowy mountains for the first time since his accident and discovering that the experience still made him feel happy and at peace marked the beginning of all's true recovery all is now a researcher at Western Washington University he's fulfilling a lifelong desire to train the next generation of climber scientists at the mountain environments research in, which he founded in 2016 we all have dreams but we usually say I'll do it when I get a chance says all lying on that mountain I realized you only get one chance to live the world is filled with stories going viral every single day but how many of these sites can you actually follow we understand that your day should start with positive stories stories that resonate with you and so we started Jojo stories our mission is to create meaningful stories that cover everything from animals to anthropology history to environment and lifestyle the kind of content you read on our site will be one you'll want to share with your family and friends we hope you'll join our growing family and be part of our community welcome to jojo stories jojostories.com